All right, let's take our Bibles. We are in 1 Timothy chapter number 3. Let's look at a few verses tonight, but we'll read the whole thing because we'll be in this chapter for at least a couple weeks, maybe three weeks. It's a very, very rich chapter, and I believe it'll be a blessing to us. Um, so 1 Timothy chapter number 3. When you found your place, let's stand together and we will read. Let's read all 16 verses. So verse number 1, 1 Timothy 3, 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double tongue, not given too much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so, must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon, well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. And uh, let's pray together and ask God's blessing as we study the Word. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, we, we thank you for the privilege it is to be your children. Uh, Lord, we thank you that we've been able to petition your throne together tonight. Lord, I pray that you would um, just bless us once again. I pray that you would just open up uh, our mind's eye this evening. I pray that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher and guide as we look into the Scripture, into the Word of God. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be just encouraged and edified. I think of uh, the, the verse there in John 17, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. And Lord, I pray that you would help uh, the word of God to enter into our eyes and our ears and um, into our mind and be understood and our hearts would be yielded to you tonight, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So remember that 1 Timothy is a pastoral epistle, and it is a behavioral manual for the New Testament church. And we just read that verse, If I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself. In the church of the living God, which is uh, the house of the living God, the pillar in the ground of the truth. And so in chapter number 1, the Apostle Paul talks about how that, that faith is worth contending over and uh, that Timothy was to be on the guard for false doctrines that would come into the church, and that he personally was supposed to get a good grip of his faith, lest he would swerve aside and make himself shipwreck. And then in chapter number 2, Paul says, first of all, prayer. And all of chapter number 2 has to do with what just took place, the church prayer meeting, and God's people as they get together in prayer. You see that God never did anything miraculously in the book of Acts. Remember the book of Acts is about the Acts of the Apostles. So they, they never did any outward acts that were successful until the church first got together in prayer. And so we're, we said the Word of God enters in, and then we respond through prayer, and then we respond through activity. 
And so God uses the prayer of his saints. Um, so like the mailers go out this week, you and I need to be praying that the Holy Spirit uses the word of God uh, and that people will read those cards and that people will go to the website and watch that video uh, and that people will be saved because of uh, not only those efforts, but because the Word of God is doing its work and the Holy Spirit, we have uh, asked for His help uh, in birthing people in the kingdom of God. So uh, the church prayer meeting, chapter number three, and our chapter number two. Chapter number three has to do with the organization of the New Testament church. And um, someday we'll do the acrostic Baptists, but uh, two of those T's, it's a B-A-B. Is it B-A-B-T-I-S-T? Baptist. Um, the two T's in there. You have two ordinances, and then you have two offices found in the church. And the two offices are found here in this chapter. So we'll just look by an introductory way into these two offices that are inside the local New Testament church. We'll look at verse number one. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office... Of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Uh, look at verse number 13. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree. So, in this portion of scripture, we have two offices. Um, one of the things that we see uh, throughout scripture is that uh, God's people, in an organized fashion from the very beginning, have got together to worship the Lord. Um, you know how Cain found Abel on the Lord's Day? They sacrificed at the same locale, the same location, uh, and uh, they had some sort of organized church service when they got together. And, uh, and from the beginning, we see that there was an organized fashion uh, for the way that God's people worshipped him. I like uh, Acts chapter number 7. Or it says in my King James Bible, it says about how that uh, there was a church of God in the wilderness. There was an organized entity out there in the wilderness. And so there's always been different offices. Now in this era or this dispensation or this side of the cross, we see there's two different offices, but God has always taken his offices very seriously. Uh, look if you will to a few Old Testament verses here. Uh, look at Exodus chapter number 18. Exodus chapter number 18. Exodus 18 and verse number 21. Here's some of the requirements for uh, the judges of Israel. In Exodus 18, 21, it says, Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds and rulers of fifty and rulers of ten. And so you see the prerequisites, and some of these prerequisites we're gonna, are going to overlay pastors and overlay deacons as well. Look at this. Moreover, thou shalt provide men out of the people, able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating, hating covetousness. Uh, and uh, look, if you will, to Leviticus chapter number 10. Here's the office of priest. Leviticus 10, verse number 8. It says, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink. <laughs> Nadab and Abihu just died. So this should be obvious, right? Uh, they got drunk. <laughs> hey, let's offer up some our own uh, our own brand of incense there before the Lord, uh, and they became crispy critters, right? Uh, and so, when you're coming before the Lord, you better be very careful. You know, James chapter number th three says, "Be not very many masters." You know that I that uh, that uh, you get up and teach the Bible in front of people, and particularly kids. You know when it talks about a millstone tied around your neck and cast in the sea? Uh, if you've ever been a child in a church and you've had a teacher teach you something that he or she does not live up to, woe be 
to you. Okay? That's what we're saying like with adults. Um, Jesus isn't just for kids. Jesus isn't just for junior church. That adults need to take Jesus seriously well. And we all need to put ourselves underneath the learning and the tutelage of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know? Uh, so here, here is the, the prerequisite for Levites. Nine, verse nine, do not drink wine nor strong drink thou nor thy sons with thee when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation lest ye die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. Um, so again, we're on a Wednesday night. We're not on a Sunday morning. So I don't try to s- scare people who are just new in the faith. But, but you're see, you came out on a rainy Wednesday night. Right, so you're pretty dedicated. Pat yourself on the back. Give yourself a hug tonight. <laughs> Learn that from Joel Osteen. Um, <laughs> so we live in a New Testament age of grace, man. You know, we don't live under the law. God would never kill. You ever read First Corinthians? You know, uh, chapter number eleven. Many of you are sick. <laughs> Many of you are dead because you've taken out the Lord's table unworthily, right? Uh, how about Ananias and Sapphira, right? Um, they lied before the congregation and got boom. Uh, and so here we see the same thread. Uh, so don't, don't just come waltzing in the congregation um, lest you die. Verse number 10, that ye may put a difference between holy and unholy, between unclean and clean, that ye may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. Look, if you will, to Deuteronomy chapter number 17. So Deuteronomy, I really enjoy it when I get through the first four books of the Bible and rolling the Deuteronomy. I really like Deuteronomy. I don't know about you, but it's a recap. It's a second giving of the law, and there's a lot of devotional material in there. Uh, and remember, the, the journey of the children of Israel has to do with you and me. These were written for our ensamples. So the things that they go through, uh, we go through. And beware of sitting in the judgment seat. Why are they murmuring and complaining? I've got news for you. I do as much murmuring and complaining as those children of Israel did in the wilderness. So I should learn from them. Uh, but here's something interesting, that the Lord was to be the sovereign. He was to be the king when they entered into the promised land. And they were just to have judges that would execute the law of God in the land. And they were to be like, unlike any other people group of that day and age and of that time. All the pagans had kings. Uh, but, but the Lord was going to be their king. But he knew mankind and he made provisions. Kind of like polygamy. If you want to have more than one mother-in-law, <laughs> you know, go ahead, God says. But you're going to regret it. And there is warnings about polygamy in the Bible, and God makes allowance, and that was, that was the status quo of society during that time frame, that God never uh, condoned it. He didn't tell guys to go out and give a multiplicity of wives. Instead, he said not to. Um, but he says that you're going you're gonna to get a king. I, I know what you guys are like. You're going to want to be like the world. You're going to get a king. And when you get a king, here should be his prerequisites. So remember, we're going to talk about pastors and deacons and prerequisites for them. Uh, but here is for the office of a king. Deuteronomy 17. Verse number 14. Deuteronomy 17, 14. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose, one from among. Um, here's, here's another thing about the, ch- the church. In a sense, the church doesn't choose a pastor. In a sense, the church doesn't choose deacons. What the church is doing is saying, we believe that this is who the Holy Spirit is placing into this particular office. And, and, um, and so there is a difference there. We heard a bunch of crazy stuff yesterday. Dad and I did. Brother Stiles did too. I had two phone calls on the way back from this meeting from guys. <laughs> like, what? Whatever. Um, 
I just laugh if I'm at someone else's church and, you know, stuff's being said that I don't agree with. Uh, but anyway, uh, one of the guys, the church doesn't choose, uh, uh, whatever. Uh, but church chooses a pastor in a technical sense, but in an untechnical way, we are saying this is who we're laying hands on. We believe that the Holy Spirit is raising up this particular person for this particular office, whether that's pastor or deacons. Uh, so in the same sense, um, Israel's supposed to choose a man after God's own heart, which remember David was. Remember Saul? He was a man after the flesh. Tall, dark, and handsome. Head and shoulders above everybody. David's short and ruddy. He's just a you know, redhead stepchild. Okay? He's, um, he's a ginger. Okay? I thought that was funny. But uh, anyway... <laughs> My brother's got red hair, and he, he works with a bunch of wild guys, the, the French you boys. And uh, he says every once in a while, when I walk behind him, he works for them so that, that you know, they, can, they can do this to him. They'll kick him in the backside. Did he ever tell you that, Dan? Say, it's National Kick a Ginger Day. <laughs> but anyway, so so, so, so was uh, tall, dark, and handsome. Man, at the, when the people saw Saul... You remember what they did? They all clapped and said, yay, this is our king. And so they chose a man after the flesh. Um, but God rejected him and raised up a man after his own heart. So we see a contrast there uh, in the Bible. So in verse number 15, it says, Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, to the end that he should multiply horses, for as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver or gold. So we're, again, we're going to see some of these same things. One woman man, okay? Not covetousness, uh, no covetousness, not uh, going after filthy lucre. And then also this king is supposed to be a man of the word. Verse number 18, And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and the statutes to do them. So I, I would like to picture this in a literal sense. I would like to think that the king is commanded by God to, with his own hand and with his own pen, write out, as a scribe would, the whole law of God. And then it says that he would read it all the days. That's plural. So every day he's looking in the law of God so that every judgment that he makes is going to be according to Scripture. So he's going to be a man of the book. He's going to know what God thinks about different matters, and he can execute judgment according to the law of God. So when he makes a decision, he can think the law says this. God's law says that about this, and he can execute according to the law's demands. Um, so we see that God's attitude is that in a position in his, in his kingdom, in his church, um, that it would be a position of importance and then also a position of esteem. And um, it should be something that would be taken with gravity. Or the word used there in um, 1 Timothy 3 is sobriety. Like this is a serious matter. It's not just a, you know, church isn't just a club or a social group. Uh, but what you're doing, executing the office, it is a something to be, the office is to be respected. The office is to be revered. So me as a pastor or the, uh, got, you know, deacons here in the church, that we're not supposed to take ourselves seriously in a sense, but our office we should take very seriously. And um, so it's like, you know, someone can make fun of me, I'll laugh. Because there's a lot to make fun of there, you know. <laughs> but it's, if someone comes after my office or after my position, well... You know, Paul said, I defend my 
office, right? And so these are, these are uh, offices that are very important. Uh, and we see the tradition kept from the Old Testament and the New Testament uh, here in this church age. We see these two offices and their importance. So back in our text, 1 Timothy chapter number 3, so this is a true saying. The first thing uh, here I want to make mention of is the test of desire. So this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Um, desire means to stretch or to long for. There is a mention about calling, and I think really the, the church's job is to recognize whether or not the man is called. But first off, there's got to be a desire inside of that own man's heart. Um, the guy said yesterday, I agree with, like, I, I was never called. I just de desired to serve God and I ended up in this capacity. And I really uh, believe that's how the Lord leads you is you're faithful. There's a principle of fidelity and faithfulness. And um, I can think of in my own life, in my own testimony, and this is, is mine, as Brad was saying, we all come, we have different uh, experiences, but um, just being very involved in church and being fascinated by the Word of God uh, and just loving ministry. I can't say there's a moment in time where God said, uh, I want you to be a preacher, Jack. If, if there was a time, that would have been the day I got saved. <laughs> I mean, the day I got saved, I was drafted, man, I was all in. Um, and there's, there's different, you know, things in my, uh, in my life that probably, you know, pulled me in this direction. I really love reading the Bible and I, I would listen to a, a sermon on the way into work, listen to a sermon on the way home from work, uh, stopped by, uh, Mardell's Christian bookstore, man, back in the, that's when Christian bookstores used to actually have books. <laughs> now they can't compete with Amazon, you know, and I go, I go to the discount rack and all the good stuff really was on the discount rack. All these volumes by Spurgeon, R.A. Torrey, D.L. Moody, and I'd read and read. I'd read these volumes, you know, and I remember one time walking around Lake. I can't remember what Lake it was with Julie. We were walking the dogs. Before you, before you have kids, <clears throat> if you have pets, the dogs are your, your children. So they were like our children. They're like your, then once you have kids, then the dogs become your pets again, you know. So we're walking our children, our dogs, <clears throat> around the lake. And I remember talking, like, I, I think that I would I could pastor a small church someday. You know, I, I think I'd do. Um, I don't know why I said s small church. There's no such thing as a small church. They're all, all in the big time, right? Um, but just, just the desire. And um, so there's a test of desire. And here is a famous quote from Spurgeon about this. Uh, here is, he's uh, talking to his students in lectures to my students. He said, if any student in this room could, not, could be content to be a newspaper editor, a grocer, or a farmer, or a doctor, or a lawyer, or a senator, or a king, in the name of heaven and earth, let him go his way. If, on the other hand, you can say that for all the wealth in both the Indies, you could not and dare not espouse any other calling so as to be put aside from preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ than depend on it. If other things be equally satisfactory, you have the signs, um, you have the signs of this apostleship. So he says, essentially, if you could step down to be king, he's like, go ahead and be king. If something else would satisfy you, go ahead and be satisfied by something else. But if you have the desire, um, then welcome aboard. So there's a desire for the office. Uh, secondly, the office uh, Im implores work. Um, he desires a good work. So verse number one, and this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Paul compares being a pastor, here's young Timothy, and really, let me see this in a generic context too, and I'll believe it at this point later. Um, is that pastor means shepherd, and in some way, some form, some fashion, everybody in this room is shepherding another soul, another individual. 
you, you are a leader of, you're an influencer of, um, you're leading towards Christ, you're watching over their soul. So I'm talking to parents, I'm talking to grandparents, I'm talking to brothers, I'm talking to sisters. So in a generic sense, you ought to consider yourself a shepherd, not in an official capacity. The same thing with a deacon. Uh, the word deacon is a generic term throughout Scripture. Uh, and that's the number one um, identifier, usually in most of the epistles. Paul is servant. You know what he's saying? Paul a deacon of Jesus Christ. Uh, James a servant. Jude a servant. Uh, everybody's introducing themselves in a generic sense as a deacon. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Um, and so in a sense, in a generic sense, we're all shepherds, we're all servants. And both of these implore or um, point towards a matter of work and labor. Uh, so Paul, in his epistle, compares the work of pastor to a workman. Workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He compares a uh, shepherd to being a soldier, continuously. It's going to be in the next chapter. It was in the first chapter. I remember uh, we're going through the first chapter. We said, uh, first Paul talks army, then he talks navy. He talks about being a soldier, then he talks about not being made shipwreck. Um, Any man that warreth and tangleth himself in the affairs of this earth is not worthy to be a soldier of him who hath called him. Uh, so we're a soldier, soldier work. Um, farmer, farmers work hard? Shit, no, not really. <laughs> not if you have 11 kids. <laughs> Not really. I, I know they're all goofing off and Chad's, you know, got a um, farmer. I mean, you're sowing, you're plowing, you're pulling weeds. You're a farmer. An athlete. He talks about those that strive for the masteries. He talks about being a boxer. You know, I'm fighting. I'm fighting not as one that's beating the air. My fists are landing on their mark. Uh, so there's a desire for a good work. Uh, and I've, I've noticed this. Um, <laughs> There's some guys that want the office, but they don't want to work. <laughs> Meaning, they'll come to a church fellowship, and they ain't helping clean up afterwards. I mean, they are on spiritual welfare. Uh, you know, it's funny. We, we're going to look at uh, Acts chapter number 6 and uh, the need for deacons. Remember, this was at a church fellowship uh, where the Grecian widows were feeling they were getting gypped. Uh, and you know how fellowships go. The first 50 people in line stacked the fried chicken all the way to the top of the roof. And by the time those in the last of the lines... Unless you have people serving, right? Uh, they don't get any, and the people at the end are bad. Uh, and then particularly the people who didn't bring anything, they're the most upset. It's kind of like, it's, <laughs> there's some, and it, this is true of church. I mean, you know this. Um, I mean, armchair quarterbacks are a real thing in church. So people who can figure out the most problems with church are people who don't do anything. You know that, right? And And... Someone who has never been involved in church, never worked in a ministry, never taught a Sunday school class, never went out door knocking, uh, you know, never, you know, done anything, changed a light bulb at a church. I mean, they can tell you exactly how a church ought to be run, right? Uh, it says in Proverbs, a sluggard can render every man a reason. The guy sitting on his couch can tell you how to do anything. He's an expert on how to do anything out there. Uh, and so uh, he that desired to... Uh, he that desireth the office of a bishop desireth a good work. Here's what Paul says about his laboring effort. Listen to this. Here's 1 Corinthians 15.10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Um, I tell you what, um, God's faithful people are more of a conviction to my own work ethic than anything else out there. People who just serve the Lord faithfully day in, day out, nonstop. Here's one of the great saints of yesteryear. R.G. Lee. How many ever knew, watched Adrian Rogers? Man. Love worth finding ministry. He had it all. Kind of looked like Ronald Reagan or something. I mean, tall, you know, he's 
dignified, genuine man. I, I tell you what, uh, Brother Johnny Pope, he knew both these men here, R.G. Lee, and then he knew Adrian Rogers, and um, he's super impressed with Adrian Rogers, just a gem. So, like, when you see him preach, he wasn't just a show. I mean, he was the real deal. Uh, but his, Adrian Rogers' predecessor there, R.G. Lee, preached a famous sermon. It's on YouTube. I encourage you to listen to it. It's a classic. And it's, um, it's in a classical style. Payday someday. I saw Ahab as a giant toad squatting over the nation of Israel. And, and he preaches in an old style. But uh, payday someday, payday someday. And so R.G. Lee, when he took his church down there at Bellevue, he said this to his congregation. He, he said, my motto as your pastor, here, here's him as a preacher kid. My motto as your pastor is the same as the Apostle Paul who said, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. And that was his promise to his congregation, which he kept all the years of his ministry. And you read about the great man and the great work ethic. And here's a great pulpiteer, great, uh, great pastor. Uh, let's remember, every weekday, I was thinking it was 6.30 in the morning, between 6.30 and 7.30, he'd go to the hospital and go visit parishioners in the hospital and go from room to room in the hospital. He'd get into his office at 7.30. And then in the afternoon, uh, he'd go out and make visits and phone calls and everything, even when he ran thousands of people. Amazing. So he that desireth the office of a, a bishop desireth a good work. Uh, here is the threefold work of a pastor. We're, we'll talk about the work of a deacon as well. Not tonight. Well, we will sometime, uh, but look at uh, look if you will, and we'll uh, we'll jump back into this threefold work of a pastor. But let me show you one particular scripture. Let's turn. Let's see. Let's turn to First Peter chapter number five. So 1 Peter chapter number 5, so Paul says in uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 3, the man desire the office of a bishop, and a bishop, um, the word there used is often translated in your Bible, overseer, and in 1 Peter chapter number 5, we'll see this threefold description of the pastoral office. All three of here are included about the same office. And we'll see in 1 Peter chapter number 5, verse number 1. It says there, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So he mentions an elder, verse number 1. Verse number 2, he says, Feed the flock. Of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. Feeding a flock would have to do with the word poimen, pastor. So when you say pastor, it is an agrarian term. It has to do with shepherd. And I love the word pastor. That's my favorite term for that threefold office. Uh, and so here in verse number two, he says, Feed the flock of God, which is among you taking the oversight. And oversight uh, has to do with presbyter or um, bishop, as mentioned by Paul in 1 Timothy chapter number 3. Uh, so feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither, being as, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but be in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory, which fadeth not away. Um, so look at 5.1. Let's talk about elder real quick, the function of elder. Uh, the elders that are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder. Again, elder is a generic word, but is also a word used for a particular office. He says, I am an elder. Uh, so this has to do with um, leadership, spiritual maturity, spiritual leadership over the congregation. Uh, one of the prerequisites that um, 
will we'll go over in pastoring. It says not a what? Novice. novice. A novice means newly planted. So someone who has spiritual gravity or spiritual uh, maturity. Someone who can be an example of the flock. Look at you, Will, to verse number three. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being end samples for the flock. So you're supposed to demonstrate spiritual maturity uh, so people can follow you. And um, I like this verse here. Look, if you will, keep your finger there, would you? Turn real quickly to 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. Look at verse number 24. And this is one of the verses I keep in mind for pastoring. Um, has I got enough problems to say grace over? I don't need to tell you, like, you know, what car to drive and what house to buy. And, um, you know, I, I can give you biblical principles. And you come and, you know, t- talk about something general. I'll just ask a lot of, well, what about this? What about that? What about the other? Um, I, you know, I... If you're doing something that's contrary to the law of God, I'll tell you, like, you're not supposed to commit fornication. I know that's like a really, really, it says that in the Bible? Uh, stuff like that, I mean, I'll tell you, you know, <laughs> but mo- most of the stuff in the Bible, there's biblical principles and things like that. Uh, and so here, here's a principle, verse number 24, not that we have dominion over your faith, okay, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. Um, brother, Brother Dalton, who's the other guy from Florida? Knox. Knox. Brother Knox was talking about Nehemiah. Um, what is the, the, the what of the Lord is my strength? And that verse was given where Ezra the scribe preached from the word of God and the people were given understanding of the word of God and they got joy from God's word and that joy that was that would that they found in God's word that was their strength and then it says that that you might stand in faith well where does faith come from faith cometh by hearing by the word of God um and so just real quickly let's turn back here give me two minutes I'm done um so an elder, an example. So he says, feed the flock which is among you. Remember, Jesus said, lovest thou me more than these? So now he'd be, you know, if the Lord was here, you know what he'd be saying to me? Jack, you love me? Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Uh, feed the flock of God. We'll talk about that. Um, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. So a, a bishop, and we can talk about this too, Answer this real quick. Maybe we'll talk about it later. Um, I think that in most churches there was a multiplicity of pastors, especially like in the, for instance, like in the Church of Jerusalem, they had apostles and they had pastors. Um, and so there, many times there was a plurality of pastors. However, there would have been a lead pastor. You can see this in different places, particularly um, in the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter number 15, um, where there's apostles there. Some of them have gone off in missionary work, but there's apostles there. There's other pastors there. But James stands up and says, I make this decree. James, lead pastor, First Baptist Church of Jerusalem, right? Um, So there is an oversight of a pastor where where, uh, the pastor is to be a leader in the church. And notice, not by constraint. So it's not like a dictatorship of a pastor, uh, but willingly. So there you see the threefold function. We'll talk about that a little bit uh, next week. We'll talk a little bit about the work of a deacon as well. And then we'll get into the tests of a pastor and the tests of a deacon and um, talk about really the, the principles of Christian living. And these principles are not just like, man, I'm glad I'm not a deacon. I don't have to do any of that stuff. <laughs> right? uh, a lot of those are going to be principles for Christian living that we, we should try to uh, live up to and our own personal lives. So let's, uh, let's stop there. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, we, we, we love you. We thank you that um, when we were saved, we were placed into a body, and we don't have to live the Christian existence, the Christian life here on this earth alone. 
Uh, Lord, we thank you that you've given us uh, structure and you've given us a, a guidebook uh, for how to conduct business uh, in your church. And Lord, we, we just thank you for uh, what we've gone over tonight. I, I pray that you would uh, bless the word as it's been um, read and, and explained. I pray that you'd help us uh, just to take heed to it. I pray you bless us, give us safe journeys home. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. We are dismissed much for tuning in to the services of the Lighthouse Bible Baptist Church. We wanted to tell you about our new app that you can go to the App Store right now and find the Lighthouse Bible Baptist Church app. And there on our app, you'll find all of our services there. You'll find all of our music specials. Also, we have podcasts. We have blog posts there. And uh, you can look up our coming events. You can sign up for events there. And it's a beautiful new application. We're very excited to tell you about it. And please go right now and download that app. God bless you, and we'll see you next time.